All right, to all who are new here, my name is Dr. Michelle Henney, and I'd like to welcome you to Releve Sports Medicine's Virtual Journal Club. For additional webinar educational opportunities, you can visit our website and register directly for the webinar or sign up for the email list to be notified of upcoming webinars. We are continuing to update our schedule, so check back often. The information contained in the video content represents the views and opinions of the presenters and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Releve Sports Medicine. The mere appearance of video content on the website does not constitute an endorsement by RSM or its affiliates of such video content. The video content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The video content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have read or seen on the site. RSM hereby disclaims any and all liability to any party for any direct, indirect, implied, punitive, special, incidental, or other consequential damages arising directly or indirectly from any use of the video content, which is provided as is and without warranties. We are looking for an athletic trainer to join our team. This is a combined position working in a sports medicine clinic and in a university role. Please feel free to pass our information along if you know of a qualified candidate. More information regarding applying can be found on our website. For all athletic trainers who are intending to get live CEUs from the BOC, you will receive an email one hour after the webinar concludes, which includes a quiz to the, which includes a link to the combined quiz evaluation and assessment. You will have up to 72 hours to complete the quiz and the evaluation. This email will come from customer care at gotowebinar.com. Please ensure that this is done to receive your statement of credit. If you don't receive the follow-up email or you have any other concerns, then contact us via our email at journalclub at relevesportsmedicine.com. Once the statement of credit is available for download from our website, you will receive an email notification. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit the questions and you, we will review the questions at the conclusion of the presentation. If you cannot see the PowerPoint slides and you're accessing the webinar from your mobile phone, swipe the screen to the left or to the right and the slides will become visible. The recording will be available for review from our website tomorrow. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Harrison Yeomans. He completed his grad undergraduate training at the University of South Carolina and his medical degree at the Medical University of South Carolina. He also completed his residency at MUSC in family medicine with a sports medicine academic track, followed by a sports medicine fellowship at American Sports Medicine Institute in Birmingham, Alabama. He recently joined Rothman Orthopedics after previously serving as the fellowship director of the Sports Medicine Fellowship at Orlando Health, where he also worked with the MLS Team Orlando City, NWSL Team Orlando Pride, WWE, and AAF Team Orlando Apollos. He has been involved with multiple, multiple publications, including notably the use of musculoskeletal ultrasound and regenerative therapies in soccer, published in the American Journal of Orthopedics, and a paper that we published together on the trends in utilization of image guidance for hip joint injections in the Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine. He has educated numerous times, including on the use of ultrasound in knee and ankle injuries at the 2019 MLS Medical Symposium and served as course director for the Diagnostic Musculoskeletal Ultrasound and Guided Injection Therapies for Lower Extremity Injuries at the 2018 MLS Medical Symposium. He will be presenting this evening on the basics of musculoskeletal ultrasound. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Henning, for the introduction and for the uh, invitation to speak. I will um, put this into slideshow mode. Perfect. So uh, like Dr. Henning mentioned, I, I did recently um, uh, join Rothman Orthopedics and, and Advent Health um, and uh, have, have continued to utilize ultrasound in my practice. Um, this is one of my favorite talks because um, it, it definitely gives us a chance to kind of show some of the ways that we use this and, and give a chance for people to see um, some different modalities than you might uh, use. But obviously it's, it's definitely become um, utilized more, especially in sports medicine and the athletic training world. and um, in, in our clinics. So I'll start by um, saying I have no relevant financial disclosures. Um, and what we'll do from an objective standpoint 
is briefly review ultrasound as a modality um, in clinical practice. Um, I, I put the word brief on purpose. I, I'll bring up the physics of, of how it works basically, but not belabor the point. Um, and then I have quite a few slides of anatomic structures because I think that we, we learned some vocabulary and some ways to describe what we see, but it's also nice to see um, some images of what we're actually looking at and looking for. Um, and and we'll, we'll move that into then the um, application for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. Um, everybody loves to learn the, uh, the injections and, and how to go through those. Um, and so I think it's important to realize that we utilize it for, for both. And then I have a couple of cases at the end that just illustrate how we, we use this modality on a daily basis. So it's definitely been a, a rapidly evolving modality um, in sports medicine and, and in musculoskeletal medicine in general. Um, the most interesting thing to me about ultrasound is that it's a point of care test. And so um, it's given us the opportunity to be in clinic with a patient and you have the same provider who can obtain the information, interpret the information and, and create a plan, or in some cases, you know, perform a procedure um, with the imaging studies. And, and that's, that's a double-edged sword. Uh, most of the time it's good. Uh, what I do tell people when they're learning this is, particularly if you have people who are going to be very anxious about getting a result, um, you have to manage the patient sometimes too and sort of let them know that you have to do a full evaluation and, and sort of interpret things. And, and I've had a couple of anxious athletes who literally you touch them with the probe and they say, what does it show? And, and you have to sort of buy some time and, and manage the room a little bit more than you would if you're able to interpret an MRI after the fact um, in a different location. So the advantages of it, I, I think that point of care, um, you know, capability is, is the main advantage that we see. Um, the resolution year over year, literally, um, these machines improve. And so um, the capabilities that we have to be able to evaluate soft tissues are, are pretty impressive at this point. Uh, the lack of radiation, of course, when you compare it to X-ray or CT scan, um, it, it's relatively cheap uh, for the patient in terms of the cost, both to the patient and the healthcare system. Um, color Doppler is nice to be able to use, and, and I'll show some examples of that. And so obviously, um, vascular ultrasound has been used for a long time, but I actually utilize the color Doppler a lot when I'm doing a procedure because we can see the flow of medication and it just gives us another clue that we've gotten exactly where we're trying to go if we're doing a, a procedure with ultrasound. And then, of course, the needle guidance for, um, for injection therapies and dynamic exam capabilities. And, and I have a couple of pictures of that later on. But, um, you know, if you have a muscle strain and you want to see when they flex that muscle, if there's any gapping uh, to demonstrate discontinuity of fibers, um, we'll do dynamic evaluations on throwers a lot to evaluate the ulnar collateral ligament and how wide the gap may be between the bones to, to test the joint. You know, the, the disadvantages are um, it's highly user dependent. And, and what I've learned about medicine in general and, and sports medicine in particular is a lot of times your job will sort of dictate what you get really good at. Um, and you may be able to choose that and, and that, that's great, but we don't always. And so, you know, for example, my first, um, my first job was in Baltimore and, and lacrosse was certainly very big there. So we were doing a lot of upper extremity ultrasounds when I moved to Orlando, I had not had a lot of experience prior to that with soft tissue injuries in, in the leg, but, you know, taking care of professional soccer, we did a lot of hamstrings and, and quad evaluations and um, you, you learn by doing in this case, but it is user dependent. Um, you know, it's not the best modality to see certain structures and certainly if you're trying to evaluate a structure inside of a joint, so say a hip labrum or a, a shoulder labrum, it, it may be limited relative to other modalities like MRI. And part of what we have to manage is just the, the clinical efficiency. It, it, it does um, improve your clinical care, but it does slow things down a little bit when you have to you know, get the machine in the right position, um, put the information into it. And so um, trying to balance uh, you know, what to use when and, and how to incorporate it is, is one of the challenges for us. So when I think about, you know, how do we utilize it? What are the diagnostic capabilities? Um, you know, it, it's excellent for tendons. Um, we're able to evaluate acute, you know, tendonitis or chronic tendinopathy. Um, you can utilize it for evaluating ligaments, um, sprains or, or tears. Um, I, I've used it in my practice, frankly, probably the most for muscle injuries um, over the past few years. There is a growing um, group of people who are evaluating nerves uh, for peripheral entrapments. Um, subluxations, for example, in, in baseball players with the ulnar nerve. 
Um, you can evaluate soft tissue masses or fluid collections. Um, you know, if, if you are concerned about a tumor, um, what may be a lipoma, um, hematomas, um, moral ovale lesions, bursitis. So you can get a sense of the size of fluid collections. And frankly, in some of the cases where you might want to aspirate, you can tell whether it's going to be a, a aspiratable liquid as opposed to um, some hematoma that may have started to clot already. And uh, occasional use for fractures, and particularly in the training room, it, it's a quick and easy way to just put the ultrasound on a long bone in particular and, and evaluate for fracture. And actually recently diagnosed a, a nightstick fracture of the ulna in, in my kitchen because <laughs> I had a portable unit and one of my neighbors came over. So um, on the fly, these things can be, can be helpful too. And then for therapeutic interventions, um, again, aspiration, um, needle guidance for tenotomies or, or injections, um, hydrodissections around nerves. Um, you know, the, the, the list of therapeutic interventions is, is growing all the time. Um, large contingent in primary care sports medicine now that are doing carpal tunnel releases under ultrasound guidance. So um, any way you can think of to use it, people are, people are beginning to. So if we kind of talk about ultrasound in general, what it is, what it means, how it works. And, and so, you know, the first question is what is sound? And, and so it's mechanical energy and it's transmitted by sound waves um, and they go through a medium and obviously they travel differently through solid liquid and, and air. Um, you have to have that medium uh, for the sound waves to travel through. And that's why if you put an ultrasound on skin just by itself, you won't see much. Um, but it, we have to use the ultrasound gel uh, to be able to trans transmit those sound waves. So ultrasound itself is, is that sound that is outside of the, the frequency upper limit of what we're able to hear. Um, so typically above 20,000 hertz. So you don't hear a sound, obviously, when you are, are utilizing these, and that's because it's outside of our ability to hear. But those sound waves are what give us the, the images. So your typical unit, um, there are probably three different ways it might look. Uh, one is there are large um, uh, cart-based units um, and, and some of the older ones are extremely large, um, but they tend to have a monitor and, and they are on wheels. They'll have the probes and then some type of keyboard or, or way of, of data entry. Um, this one is more of the laptop briefcase style where it's certainly more portable. You can close that up. It's got the handle on the front and then the probes attached directly into it. And these types will have a cart that they can sit on. And then there are some handheld units now, um, some of which will plug directly into a device. Others will um, transmit your, your picture um, either wirelessly or, or through Bluetooth. So um, different, different um, applications and, and to be frank, probably different image quality um, depending on what type of uh, unit you're, you're using. Um, so multiple different types of probes, and, and these have evolved. Um, the ones that we use in clinical practice for orthopedics are the two in the middle. Uh, the one at the top is typically used in other types of, uh, of medical practices. Um, but the, uh, the curvilinear probe there, the second one down, is uh, the one that we typically go for, to for deeper structures. Or the other benefit to it is having that rounded edge allows you to sort of uh, tilt the probe a bit where you can get underneath it if you're trying to get to a certain structure. Um, I think specifically of the, the glenohumeral joint, the posterior approach, I'll, I'll show in a bit, but being able to work underneath the probe and, and so you're, you're getting over the humeral head. The linear probe, which would be the third one down, is the one that's most commonly used, generally speaking. And then there are those smaller probes, which are very high frequency. Some of them are, are referred to as hockey sticks. They have that kind of shape to them. Uh, but low profile and, and looking at, at very superficial structures. So the way these things are built is they have these crystals um, toward the, the end of the probe and then obviously there are electrodes in it. So um, the, the machine will send a current uh, through those crystals that cause them to basically expand and contract, which creates vibration. That then creates the, the ultrasound waves that go into the tissue Pull through these. So what, what will happen then is um, those sound waves will go through the tissues, they will bounce back and be reflected off of the different tissues. And when those sound waves, depending on how quickly they come back, um, the, the machine will then process that and create an image, which is what we see um, on the screen. What creates different 
degrees of black, white, and gray is the change in density. Um, so a higher density change from one uh, tissue to the next will create a, a brighter white or what we'll call hyperechoic um, uh, result. So um, when we look at these probe types, uh, like I said, the linear and the curvilinear are the two that we use the most. Um, pay attention to this part because that might be uh, on some of the questions, but um, the, the higher frequency is the linear probe and, and the curvilinear is, is the lower frequency. Higher the frequency, the higher the resolution. So you get less penetration of the tissues. So it's, it's better used for more superficial structures. And like I said, with the lower frequency, it, it's the, the big base, right? Treble versus base. And so lower frequency is going to penetrate better. Um, we'll get better images of deeper structures, but the resolution gets sacrificed a little bit with that. So I, I switched the slides here, and, and uh, when I give this talk in a in a room, um, I find that you know having it dark makes it a little bit easier to see. But we'll go through some terminology. So when we talk about echogenicity or echogeneity, depending on on what uh, you read or who you talk to, that is the description of basically how bright uh, each part of the image is, and, and again indicates the change in density. So um, with this particular picture, what you're seeing here, this bright white line, is bone. So you've got skin, you've got sub tissues, you've got tendon here, and there's bone right underneath it. Everything behind this is all shadow um, because the sound wave cannot penetrate through the solid. Um, but that brighter white is hyperechoic, um, and, and that then indicates that the softer soft tissue versus the dense tissue of, of the bone. Isoechoic is when you look at two different tissues and, and they may be similar in terms of their, their coloration. Um, so there's not as big a delineation, say, uh, between the subcutaneous tissues. This is Achilles tendon, and then obviously the hyperechoic bone. So isoechoic just describes something that's a similar density. And then hypoechoic is relatively dark. So in this case, Kager's fat pad is hypoechoic relative to the subcutaneous tissues and the um, the tendon fibers themselves. Anechoic is black, um, and so that would be a fluid collection. Um, and this is uh, an example of a popliteal cyst, a, a large one that, that we'll see again later. But um, so typically going to represent fluid or, or air if there's sub Q air. Actually, saw a soccer player once that came in with pain in his thigh, and, and um, we evaluated him. He had he had multiple um, anechoic air bubbles underneath, and, and this was a foreign player who came with a national team, and um, they had done ozone injections, and so. Um, there was, I guess, ozone bubbles uh, in there, which looked looked uncomfortable. Um, so I will I will never have ozone injected into my quad, although probably never have the reason to. So the the next thing to talk about uh, from a from a vocabulary standpoint then is is orientation. And so um, this would be another one I would I would mark down um, when we describe the orientation of how we look at different structures um, with the ultrasound from a, from a diagnostic standpoint. Long axis is going to be in, in parallel to a structure and short axis is going to be perpendicular of the cross section. So in this case, um, we've got these pictures to kind of illustrate a superior portion of a knee. We're looking at quadriceps tendon here. So that is a long axis view of the quadriceps tendon. We rotate that probe 90 degrees and we're looking at it in cross section. That is a short axis view. Um, and I'll differentiate that with the injections, which are in plane or out of plane, but long axis and short axis are the um, diagnostic evaluation orientations. And then there are, are um, descriptions of how we categorize and, and describe different um, types of tissues. So uh, muscles, if you think about the muscle fibers, um, they're going to be running in parallel. Um, so they're, they're referred to as pinnate or, or feathery. Um, it's almost like uh, if you have a leaf, right? You have the main vein of the leaf and then you have the fibers sort of running into it. Um, in the cross section, uh, described as speckled or, or starry sky. And so you have the dark background with kind of the, the light white dots and, and the lines that would, um, would sort of uh, characterize normal muscle appearance. And generally speaking, with, with a couple of exceptions, um, uh, specifically in the leg, I think of the rectus femoris and the semitendinosus may have a little bit of a different look to them. Um, I kind of think of different cuts of steak, right? The the cross section of the meat looks different. Um, 
but uh, this is where um, it's typically going to be pretty uniform um, across the, the different parts of the muscle. Now tendon, uh, we just saw these pictures a minute ago, but it's going to be more fibrillar. These are going to be very um, tightly packed linear fibers that are running together and cross section um, relatively thick uh, in terms of how it looks and, and kind of gives you that um, like you're looking at the bottom of a, a brush or a broom. And I'll contrast that in a moment to um, nerve uh, here, which is going to be more of kind of the honeycomb picture um, where you have your uh, perineurium. Um, you're going to have uh, more of the darker coloration in the background, the hypoechoic with the anechoic dots, um, which are a little bit more spaced out um, in terms of how the, the nerve will typically appear. And in long axis, they tend to sort of have this fascicular, it's described as a tram track appearance, um, just because of the, um, the outer layer of connective tissue there is going to be more hyperechoic. And then again, bone, uh, long axis and, and short axis and cross section. And this is pretty much a similar picture to the, the ulna fracture that I saw the other day. And, and the only difference is there was a just sort of dark hash mark going across here. I need to I need to see if I can get that picture off my iPad and, and put it in here. But um, it, uh, you know, this is the typical look of bone. You have to be a little bit careful because uh, just like on x-ray, occasionally you'll see a little feeder vessel um, working its way in. And so there, there may be these little tiny punctate areas where it's not contiguous, but obviously if you put it together with a uh, direct contact and pain, then um, clinically it would it would fit. And then uh, a couple of things unique to joints, um, and, and we'll utilize this for, um, again, injections on certain occasions. This is the AC joint uh, with the clavicle here immediately and the acromion laterally. Um, sometimes you'll see these little areas where there's some hyperechoic tissue in there just indicating um, either some enthesophyte uh, at, the, at the traction site there or osteophyte. Um, but if we're going to do an injection, we can just aim right into this area. Um, the cartilage is, is anechoic. And so here we have the, the hyperechoic bone. We have shadow deep to it, but this is a femoral condyle um, where we're incidentally seeing some patellar tendinopathy where it's thick and disorganized here. But cartilage tends to be this sort of anechoic black uh, that sits over the joints. Occasionally you'll notice irregularity there or even, um, you know, if you have a large OCD, you can, you can sometimes see those. So I've got uh, the mid portion here, just a number of um, pictures and, and kind of how we, we get these things in, in clinic to just give you a sense of what we may be looking at. Um, so at the shoulder, you know, the biceps tendon sits in the bicipital groove here. You've got your deltoid overlying it, and this is a short axis view where we're in cross section of that biceps tendon. Um, a lot of the pathology will occur in this area where people have um, sort of anechoic halos of fluid. Um, but we're also seeing a good bit sometimes of people, if they have slap tears in the joint, they may get some pain where the biceps turns the corner at the rotator cuff interval. Um, so we can evaluate it that high and sort of keep that cross section up this way as we're, we're looking at it more proximally. Um, I'll always look at the subscapularis as well. Um, that superior border um, of the tendon is a common place for tendinopathy or partial thickness tears, which can cause anterior or, or lateral pain is the tendon here kind of coming across uh, from the subcoracoid area. Supraspinatus um, will often do um, in this sort of hand on hip posture here. What that does is if you think of the plane of the scapula, it rotates the humeral head forward and, and brings it out. We'll typically have the probe a little bit more vertical than that. Um, but this is the supraspinatus tendon coming to attach the greater tuberosity. Again, sometimes you'll see these little cortical irregularities, which can indicate some long-term uh, tendinopathy. So I, I got permission from my wife to share this picture. <laughs> She's my model for these things, but uh, we, we diagnosed a little tendinopathy on her when we did this. And then you can utilize that to actually do some dynamic evaluation here where that supraspinatus tendon is tucked under now the acromion. And so this is abducted. If you adduct the arm back, you get rotation of the of the humeral head here. And you can look for um, thickening of the bursal tissue or accumulation of uh, bursal fluid um, with that, that angle. Posterior shoulder, this is, this is one of my favorite um, images, one of my favorite approaches for injection. You can see the posterior glenoid here. If people have had dislocations. You may notice the hill sacs. This is the um, sorry, posterior humeral head. Uh, this is the posterior glenoid here, and then you've also got the um, the labrum uh, kind of sitting in this area with infraspinatus over top. 
And so this is a linear probe image. You can see how the line is straight across here and it's a square shape. With that curved probe, it sort of rounds out. And so you can slide that probe over and, and sort of rotate it so that you're creating enough of an angle to come in this way over top of the humeral head and just basically skim right through here between the labrum deep to the um, infraspinatus and medial to the humeral head. And then I'll often use that uh, color flow, the color Doppler there to be able to turn that on. And when I'm injecting, I'll see it light up in this area just so I know that I'm in that, in that spot that I want to be. It's good for confirmation. You know, we'll evaluate the common extensor tendon um, for lateral epicondylosis. I'll use this approach sometimes too for elbow joint injections uh, where we've got the radio capitellar joint here and you can just sort of do a direct uh, out of plane approach um, to the joint. Uh, the triceps tendon is one that in our weightlifters, professional wrestlers, um, you'll see a lot of tendinopathy here. Um, you can also utilize this to evaluate if there's an olecranon bursitis and um, sometimes they'll come in and complain of uh, what feels like a little alien kind of floating around in the skin and you can just sort of show them that it's thick and bursal tissue, which um, can often be reassuring because you have a lot of people think they chipped off pieces of bone and you can kind of prove that for them, which uh, can be helpful. Um, the medial elbow uh, will evaluate sort of the flexor pronator muscle and tendon as they attach the medial epicondyle uh, for tendinopathy, cortical irregularity. If we sort of windshield wiper that probe a little bit, we look across the joint, we can evaluate the lateral collateral ligament. And here you can do measurements of the distance from bone to bone and then stress it. And there's some normative values that um, from the baseball or softball standpoint, um, overhead athlete will use to evaluate um, side by side, but also uh, compare them to some normative data. Uh, the median nerve is one that, that often gets evaluated too. Uh, Cross-sectional areas can be evaluated to see um, you know, if it's consistent with carpal tunnel, and then also um, this gets utilized for uh, guided injections as well. And this is what it looks like further proximal between FDS and FDP in the forearm. Um, the same picture I used for that sort of tram track appearance. And the hip joint, honestly, is probably my favorite injection to do because I find that especially people who have been um, managing hip arthritis, they, they tend to come in and, and not necessarily um, know what, what kind of problem they've had. And, and um, you know, this is one where uh, we, we can do this in the clinic. And we basically, if you notice here, this is um, the femoral head and the neck. And so the capsule runs down to about right here. And uh, we can basically just run our needle right into the space, some lidocaine. Once you go through the capsule, you can actually just you hit that bone and they don't feel anything at all. And that, that also gives us obviously a sense that we're where we want to be. Uh, but we can use that color flow. But my favorite thing about this is a lot of times people, by the time they get dressed, um, you know, they're putting their pants back on or socks and shoes in the clinic and um, and they feel better. And so, you know, you, you get pretty immediate feedback with that one. So um, love that procedure and, and definitely love using this for it. Um, in, in my life as a, a soccer doc, again, did a lot of um, evaluations of um, quadriceps, and, and this is basically your AIIS uh, further proximal to the hip joint. Um, you've got your rectus femoris tendon here. Um, so we would do a lot of evaluations for these proximal rec fem injuries. Um, occasionally, you'd have um, some avulsion fractures, which are a little bit more subtle, um, that we'd, we'd find uh, doing this with the younger um, development academy or, or club, club team players. And then uh, the quad tendon we, we showed earlier, uh, the patellar tendon is one where you can utilize this as well. And that picture that I showed before, um, you know, thickening and, and sort of that hypoechoic appearance to the proximal tendon can indicate tendinopathy. Um, this is one of the ones that the patient loves if you just tell them to fire off their quad and this thing stretches out tight, um, you know, they, they get a kick out of seeing it. But um, this is the cross section too. And so this can be utilized for uh, procedural interventions. Um, sometimes I've even done ultrasound guided fat pad injections if people have a lot of patellar maltracking and they're just really painful um, right over the fat pad. You can do diagnostic injections there, which can help your surgeon know um, if they're going to scope it, if they want to go and do a significant amount of debridement in that area. The medial knee, um, I, I do evaluate uh, MCLs and, and, you know, a lot of times someone comes in with what looks like an MCL injury, but they're in, in pretty tough shape. You can make sure that there's no effusion and you're not missing anything in the joint, uh, but also sort of follow this out over time. Um, you can kind of evaluate to the deep fibers versus superficial fibers. And 
um, you get a little picture of the meniscus here as well and that meniscal capsular junction. So um, a lot of times what I'm using this for though is proximally kind of following out uh, the injured portion um, of the ligament. And then the ankle joint um, is uh, another one that we'll, we'll evaluate uh, with uh, for, for guided injections where basically you've got the tailored dome here with the ankle plantar flexus anterior ankle is the inferior part of the tibia. Um, with that ankle plantar flex, you've got talus here. There's your cartilage. And you can bring your needle right through this space into the ankle joint and, and inject there. A little bit further distal, the next picture I have is the dorsal talonavicular ligament. Um, so this is the tailor head and the navicular in front of it. So um, with, with sprain, sometimes, especially hyperplantar flexion, you can evaluate that as well. And then the ATFL is running from that inferior part of the fibula over to the talus, and this is one where you can get a good picture if there's edema or, or, or discontinuity um, of that ligament. And then the posterior medial ankle is, is one of the best ones to learn because it's got a lot of different structures, as I've kind of labeled out here, that, that you can evaluate um, and, uh, and, and trace and follow. It, it's a great area, actually, to learn um, sort of the technique of how to hold the probe and, and um, you know, evaluating for anisotropy, which is where when you tilt the probe, if it's bouncing away and not uh, basically bouncing directly back up to uh, the probe, then then some of these tendons that look bright white will turn dark. And so you can basically angle back and forth and make something go from dark to light to dark again and making sure that you're following it down where you can see it um, without that, that uh, kind of interference by having the, um, the probe uh, poorly positioned. Then the Achilles is also one that's easily evaluated. I utilize this a lot for ruptures um, in the acute phase in particular um, and uh, can help us, uh, again, communicate with the surgeons of how much of a gap there is, um, if there's a tear between those stumps and where it's located relative to um, either the insertion or, or some people like from the superior part of the calcaneus. And this is then that short axis of the Achilles tendon here. Um, with, a, with an image of that. So uh, other uses, uh, I mentioned the Doppler. So, so this is an artery ba uh, basically showing when, when you can tell arteries a couple ways, they'll, they'll sort of be pulsating, um, but you'll see this uh, just with the pulse kind of flash, um, you know, red or blue, depending on how you have the probe positioned. Um, so you can utilize it to evaluate for flow if somebody's particularly swollen um, and you're not feeling a pulse particularly well because of that. Um, you can confirm that there is one with this. Um, artifacts sometimes will will find people have painful screws and sometimes uh, or painful hardware. Um, so this is bone with the with the screw, and you'll kind of see this comet tail artifact. Um, but occasionally you'll find a tendon or a nerve or other things that are kind of snapping back and forth with motion. So a dynamic exam there can be helpful. Um, this is a lipoma. Um, so basically you have subcutaneous, uh, or sorry, the, the skin and then the subcutaneous fat here, but there's this sort of encapsulated part, isoechoic to the fat, has the same look to it uh, with muscle deep to it, but that's a lipoma. Um, you can make sure there's no blood flow into that. Um, it looks abnormal and, and uh, sort of reassure someone um, that that's what you're, what you're looking at. Uh, and this is what edema in the soft tissues looks like. So if you just have a, a grossly swollen, you know, ankle or, or, or leg, um, you put this on there and you tend to get this sort of cobblestoning look where that, that fluid is sort of tracking between the tissue planes here. Um, you may find some drainable fluid collections um, uh, depending on the, the issue. And then, uh, you know, from a diagnostic standpoint, um, just to, to sort of review muscle injuries, there are different classifications. And, and the one that has um, taken off lately is the, the British muscle injury classification. But I can kind of show you what, uh, how, how we utilize this. So um, at rest, you know, you have these the sort of pinnate uh, look of the muscle fibers here. Um, the way I sort of describe a, a, an injury, a lower grade or, or a lower grade part of a higher grade injury, it almost looks like somebody took a sponge and just sort of, you know, dabbed on that picture um, and, and blunted or blurred this out a little bit. But obviously you can see some fiber disruption here and discontinuity of that muscle. So when you have them plantar flex or, or, or contract the muscle in this case, um, you can see that that gap opens up wider um, and you see more of that, that sort of uh, disrupted muscle tissue than you do at rest. And so it can kind of help you grade out an injury a little bit. Um, you know, the, the conversation I have with people a lot and when we get into MRI versus ultrasound and, and, you know, how much does this really matter? I think to me on the sports side, 
the benefit we have to being able to grade the injury is frankly just to, to give the player, give the coaching staff an idea of how long it's going to be before we expect return to play. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, that, that there's being able to follow it out is great, but I think that's the main utility is, is trying to, to give everyone a sense of what we're looking at in terms of timelines and, and how to move forward and, and at what pace. Um, so again, grade one strains, you'll sort of get this um, just sort of blurred area of the tissue with the normal muscle um, underneath it. Uh, no fiber disruption there that you can see. And when you kind of rotate on it, this is the cross section, short axis view of muscle. So again, that dark black background um, with the with the hyperechoic uh, parts in it. This is some tendon uh, within the muscle. And then again, just almost like someone took a sponge and sort of just blurred that out, made it a little bit hyperechoic. Um, and that's what that grade one injury will look like. Uh, with the, the newer muscle classification, sometimes this could become a grade two, even with this look, uh, depending on the size of it, cross-sectional area and length of it. So the grade grade two then, um, or, or, or now strains with uh, muscle fiber disruption are gonna look this way, where we've got a lot of this disorganized tissue here, more of these kind of anechoic, hypoechoic areas. Uh, but, but clear disruption of the normal architecture of the muscle. And in cross-section, um, this is a semitendinosis. Um, so we see the that, um, intramuscular septum here. The, the fascia around the outer portion of the muscle is here. You can see that hyperechoic area. This is a, a myofascial strain where that those muscle fibers at the periphery have separated off from the, from the fascia here. And this injury kind of extends down to this area. So fairly large area um, overall and, and maybe involving this portion as well. And then a, uh, you know, a, a full thickness tear of muscle. And in this case, this is a, um, a uh, gastroc, a distal gastroc at the musculotendinous junction, um, large hematoma in this area. And in this case, we, uh, because was so separated from its attachment we went and, and aspirated it and, and so the picture of that is here so once you decompress that area you've allowed the, the you know previous fibers of where they were in continuity to come closer together and um, hopefully be able to heal uh, better and, and quicker and then you, you'll find you know with, with these um, either with the initial evaluation or sometimes subsequently you may get some fascial plane edema so this is proximal hamstring um, this is the hyperechoic triangle where you've got uh, your semimembranosus tendon, your conjoint tendon, and, and your sciatic nerve. But if you notice right around here in the fascial plane, you've got um, some kind of hyperechoic here and a little bit of hypoechoic there where there's some edema collected um, from a conjoint tendon um, strain more proximally. And then as this tissue starts to, to you know, it's disorganized initially and just all these different areas of hypoechogenicity, hypoechogenicity is very disorganized. As it begins to heal, you'll, you'll kind of start to see a little bit more of that normal architecture sort of lay down within that. So still very burnt out at this point from a higher grade injury, but you, you kind of get the sense that you're starting to see a little bit more of that normal architecture as it, as it reorganizes. And then uh, with, with a lot of our, our um, pre-participation exams, we would, we would do scans just to see if uh, we could find any previous injuries, which would give us a sense of whether or not people might have a higher risk of, of subsequent injury. But you'll find sometimes um, you know, chronically these fibrous scars uh, from prior muscle injuries. So this was pain-free and, and incidental finding, um, but this is kind of what they'll look like. They can look very, um, very hyperechoic. Sometimes there are... Um, areas deep to that, that that's almost anechoic um, but uh, variable presentation but but um, noteworthy when you find it and then a little bit about utilization for for therapeutics i think the reason to use this for for injections is um you know if, if we look at the research out there we're not as good at hitting targets based on landmarks as, as we think we are and so you know making sure that we get where we want to go is, is important for care for the patient um, it increases patient satisfaction, and, and when they can watch this, you know, some people are not going to want to watch it, but some people like to see it and um, really appreciate the fact that they can see exactly where you're aiming and that, that you got right where you wanted to go. Um, I think for me, it, it helps with comfort as well, because if I've, you know, if I'm going after a deeper structure or a sensitive superficial structure, right when I'm through the skin, I can just make sure that my alignment is where I want it to be, and, and if I need to change it. It just takes a quick, you know, re-angle, um, and then you're headed directly where you want to go. So 
there's some areas like the AC joint where you may have to fish a little bit if you're going landmark based. And so it can make it more comfortable. Um, and another thing obviously is avoiding high risk structures. So if we find, you know, arteries or nerves that we want to avoid, we can do that. Um, obviously improves your documentation. If I have a picture of my needle going where I want it to be, um, and then it is portable. And so you can take these things, you know, anywhere um, with, with the more portable units and, and utilize them in lots of different ways. Um, whether that's a sports related clinic or even an operating room for, um, for localizing uh, different areas. So when we're getting ready to do an injection, just so everyone has kind of a, a feel for, for what that looks like in the clinic, you know, we'll do a quick scan to identify um, our area of pathology um, and, and what may be around it, um, identify our structures as importantly to avoid. Um, it's important to make sure that the patient is comfortable, your, your table's comfortable, uh, or your, your table height, how they are, um, and, and sort of where the ultrasound is um, from an ergonomic perspective, especially if you're doing something that might take a little bit longer. Um, and again, you know, kind of triangulating, if I know that I have a, a, I'm over top of a structure in the midline, I need it to be two centimeters down, I can triangulate, do I need to go down here and this far over at two centimeters down, or what type of angle would I need to, to get to that spot? Um, and then, of course, you know, if, if you had a question, kind of choosing the appropriate probe. Um, you know, again, patient comfort is key. Um, the calcific tendon lavage is the thing that I do that probably takes the longest. Um, and so if I'm not in a good position and I'm sort of leaned over the patient, I'm going to hurt uh, for, for doing that. So, um, you know, when we're when we're thinking about it, too, um, making sure that we have alignment of basically I to uh, to hand with the needle to probe and then to the screen um, is, is something that we want to be aware of. I have a uh, graphic depiction of that here where you know we've got our screen set up, but eyeball to needle in hand to ultrasound and, and target, and then the, uh, the picture there. Sometimes easier said than done, depending on the room you're working in or, or the, uh, the patient. So you can use sterile preparation if you need to, if there's a superficial structure or one that you're concerned about whether you might uh, run into a, um, uh, an infection risk. Um, there are sterile probe covers that can be used with sterile gel. Um, and uh, in a pinch, um, you can use just a, a, a transparent dressing to be able to go over it um, and then put gel uh, outside of that too. Uh, this can be helpful sometimes to keep your probe clean because if you get if you use iodine for prep, uh, it can stain it. And I am notoriously guilty of of staining ultrasound probes with iodine. Um, and always teach people the the grip too. I think the the most important thing is that you know when you do an ultrasound, you, you have to touch the patient and and you've got to be in physical contact. And so if you're if you're doing something that's very fine and and just trying to make little changes. Take two hands and hold the probe with two hands. Other, otherwise, you can kind of use, I think of that C and E grip like you get taught with um, CPR for airway, um, kind of holding it with the three fingers. I have the picture there. Like think of the ulnar nerve distribution as what you want anchored on the patient. And then you can use the, the first three fingers to grip the, uh, the ultrasound. So to me, the choice of approach, you know, everybody gets comfortable with different ways of doing things, but I think you want the best access and the safest route um, and trying to find the combination to ensure you're effective, but, but first do no harm. So the, the description of this, and I, I mentioned this before, you have your long axis and short axis. So an in-plane approach is, is going to be the preference for most things where you've got the ultrasound oriented so that your, your sound waves are coming out this way beam is about a credit card width and so you have to be really careful to make sure that as you're inserting the needle it's going to be straight uh, with the probe and, and not angled because then you'll see it when you start but you'll lose it as you go further in um, and so th this is basically what an in-plane approach would look like where you're seeing the needle come from outside of your view um, in along the way um, one of the tips that we always teach and use is to try to keep the needle as, as close to parallel as we can because, again, we're looking for sound waves. And so if you've got uh, those sound waves bouncing off the needle and coming directly back, you're going to see the needle really well. If you've got an angle differently, those sound waves are going to hit and reflect away, um, and that makes it harder to see the needle. And so sometimes that you do that with the needle or your approach. Other times you can kind of heel toe your probe a little bit. Uh, to get it in line. So um, if you're practicing those things, that, that's something you can uh, sort of uh, work through when, when getting used to it. 
Uh, another one that, that I use a lot is if you're trying to do an in-plane approach to something that's really superficial or shallow, you can heap up some sterile gel on top of that, that area. And basically what you do then is create a window of gel um, where those sound waves are coming through. You can put your needle directly into that gel first. So it hasn't touched the patient. It's in a sterile environment. But you're getting yourself lined up. And so you know that, that you're lined up how you need to be. You're approaching your target you want to approach. And then basically once you kind of touch the skin, you just push right into that, that tendon sheath and, and can go. But it, Definitely helpful if you have a um, more superficial structure you're after. Out of plane approach is, is the, the opposite. So um, again, sort of a short axis view of the needle. And so in this case, um, you can, you're, you're basically just going to see that one dot uh, where that comes through as opposed to seeing the whole needle um, in plane. You know, we'll utilize this for blood draws, for PRP, for example. Um, so it's great for vascular access, you know, in, in an emergency room or ICU setting as well. Um, but again, that credit card width beam is all you get. Um, and so, you know, you're, you're going to see it at that point. And if you need to be more shallow, you can kind of pull back and then go more, more shallow, or you can kind of lift your angle up here and, and then run a deeper angle. This is the step down technique, and that's kind of how that's described. So again, this is an AC joint. So if you call this a centimeter down, you can basically just go a centimeter down and go straight in. But if you come up and you're a little bit superficial, you can just re-angle um, and kind of walk down uh, with those progressively steep angles um, into the spot where you want to be. And, and that's the that's the danger, right? Kind of describing is once you go past that dot, you don't know what's behind you. Um, and so if there's something back here you don't want to poke, um, then you've got to make sure once you see that dot come on your screen, you stop there. And then if you're in the wrong spot, you're re-angling as opposed to just pushing through. So a couple of cases just to sort of uh, illustrate how we use this. I had a 14-year-old squash player. Um, she did some extremely aggressive uh, like lunge techniques for, for training, um, had this recurrent um, popliteal cyst. Um, it limited uh, her ability to flex, caused some pain, and, and was limiting her activity. Um, normal x-rays, I got an MRI just to make sure there was nothing intraarticular otherwise that we were missing. Um, but this was her popliteal cyst. And it, I mean, you can see I only got about half of it there. Um, but when we just put the needle right in there to drain that, that's basically what it looks like. And then as you aspirate this, it all just decompresses. Um, uh, so that that's one of the, the uses. You know, the, the other one, the one that we do more than any other probably is, is using it for knee injections, um, particularly your larger knees, um, where the landmark based approach is more difficult. Um, so if you have someone with you know medial knee pain, uh, no mechanical symptoms, looks like osteoarthritis and they failed other treatments, um, you want to do an injection, aspiration injection. Um, this is uh, one, one of the best uh, learning pictures. And, and I, I look for this a lot, too, in young people. Um, and again, larger knees, it can be helpful. Sometimes you can have an effusion, which can indicate intraarticular pathology, which is more subtle. Um, so if, if I look at this and I know there's no effusion, then I feel confident that I don't need to do any, any further imaging. But in this case, the, the superior pole of the patella would be here, quadriceps tendon here. There's a, a super patellar fat pad, which is triangular, kind of right on top of the patella. There's the femur here and the prefemoral fat there. So this is the super patellar pouch, and that's what an effusion looks like. Um, in cross section or short axis, it's this. And so as we bring our needle in, we have our quad tendon. We can make sure we don't get anything into that. We just go through the retinaculum there into that space. We aspirate uh, the um, contents and then you can sort of, um, you know, exchange your syringes and then, then inject into that area. Um, I'll call myself out on this picture. My bevel was down, um, but, but uh, that's um, kind of what, what that uh, looks like and, and something we use use this for frequently because again once you get some arthritic knees especially in larger patients it can be very difficult to to know that you've gotten exactly where you want to go and i bring up the the references here you know to me i think that the jacobson book is a great place to start um it's got lots of information but it's not overwhelming i mean there are some very very exhaustive textbooks on uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound but um, if, if you're new to it and, and interested in learning, I think this is a great place to start. Um, I love the, the Atlas of Ultrasound Guided uh, Injections as well. Um, uh, so this is one that, that I, I think I have done all the ones that are in there now, but, but kept that uh, in hand um, and, and at the ready um, for a long time. 
as I was getting used to some of the approaches. And the thing I like about it is that they've got kind of the author's preferred um, option for approach to different areas and then um, sort of an alternative approach to because, you know, it can be helpful to, to have different ways of, of achieving the same goal. So um, that's my last slide. So I, uh, I will be happy to answer any questions if, if anyone has any, um, but appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to share that with you all. Awesome. Thank you. So the, I, I would, I would, while, while I wait for questions to come in, I wanted to take kind of a, the opportunity to ask. So you were talking about possibly utilizing ultrasound in the OR. In, in what scenarios have you utilized ultrasound that directly related to the OR experience? Yeah, so so I personally have, have not. Um, I uh, I was at a meeting that was uh, more geared toward orthopedic surgeons and and their potential utilization of this. Um, I think certainly in the orthopedic oncology realm, um, if they are doing soft tissue biopsies, um, they'll utilize it a lot. Um, there are um, some um, surgeons who will will use this on occasion for portal placement. Uh, again, particularly with larger uh, larger patients, um, you know the the ultrasound guided um, carpal tunnel release it can be clinic based or surgery center based as well. Um, so that's one that that is growing in popularity. Um, you know, another another area where this does get utilized is with some of the um, stem cell therapy treatments and in particular bone marrow aspirate. It, it's difficult to do ultrasound guidance um, per se uh, where you're watching the needle, but you can do kind of ultrasound assisted where if you've got an area that you want that uh, trocar to be introduced, you can use this to mark it. And so um, I think that having the capability to have that sort of x-ray vision for soft tissues so to speak um, when when you're preparing for a procedure whether it's a clinic procedure or in the OR um, is it, or, or surgery center uh, procedure room um, can be helpful awesome yeah I had one it was a jersey finger with the flexor tendon so I was able to kind of you know mark for the hand surgeon but here's where the tendon ends <laughs> Yeah, well, good point. And 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 uh, back to that Achilles example too. You can you can do the same thing basically. Take a surgical marker and just kind of mark the edges of it, um, so that if you're sending them for a consultation, that will that'll stay on there for a while. I've even done um, with with some of the pro athletes who are going to go see their athletic trainer or physical therapist. I'll I'll sort of circle the areas that are have the majority of the muscle tissue uh, tissue injury, um, or even put a band aid on it. Um, so if it's a longer area, just stick the Band-Aid and just say it's right around that spot. The interesting part is that, especially with a lot of the soft tissue injuries and, and muscle strains, people will feel the pain typically more distal to where the majority of the injury is. Um, and, and I assume that's because that inflammatory fluid will just move distally when people are standing and walking. But sometimes they'll come in and point to one spot, and that's where you can tell they're getting a lot of massage or cupping or other things, and you can kind of guide that soft tissue work a little bit more uh, toward the, the area of interest. All right, so we've got a few questions popping up here. Um, the first one is coming from Nathan, and he is asking, do you find any reimbursement issues with getting the ultrasound guidance paid? Um, I, I have not personally. Um, I, I think that in, and this is probably um, insurance dependent and um, uh, and, and location dependent, um, but um, so long as you document the reason uh, why you're utilizing it, you, you know, for me, I think um, I, I will, in a lot of cases, have a little blurb at the end of my procedure that, you know, ultrasound guidance was felt to be necessary to ensure adequate, you know, needle and medication placement and avoid whatever I'm trying to avoid, intratendinous injection or, or neurovascular injury or whatever it may be. Um, I find that from the diagnostic standpoint, um, we, we've done well getting reimbursement for that. I think, frankly, the insurance companies, you know, they have to pay less for that than, um, than an MRI. And so uh, in a lot of cases, they, they even advocate for it um, for certain conditions. Okay. But I, I would imagine that everyone's experience is, is different. 
Glenn asks, what are the costs of different, <clears throat> different machines and what would be the best way to acquire one for the athletic training room? Yeah, so they, they range significantly um, and, and it, it can depend on, um, like a lot of things in medicine, it can depend on your purchasing power um, in terms of, are you buying more than one or, or are you buying it through a hospital system that, that might be able to negotiate the rate because um, they, they are all, always negotiable. But, um, you know, it's the, the some of the handheld ones are going to be between two and three thousand dollars up to about five thousand um, dollars. A lot of the cart based ones, um, depending on how many bells and whistles you get, will be in the fifty to sixty thousand dollar range. And there's some that are that are six figures. Um, Again, depending on the, um, the the technology and the, the image quality, it, it's always interesting for me to, uh, you know, at, at AMSSM in particular, to go to the different booths and um, and even some of the. Um, I, I've never had one of the highest of high end machines. Uh, the ones I have are very very nice that, that I've used in my, my different locations. But um, you know, sometimes you you read about things that people are doing and and uh, articles that are written, and you're like, man, that just seems really hard to to pin it down that that discreetly and then you go and use some of these things that they might have and you're like oh well that, that makes a difference so um uh but but the the cost can range significantly i, I think like anything else when you're trying to get equipment it, it's you know how how can you justify the expense and and so if you're able to keep um uh, keep some of this evaluation in house if you're able to improve the quality of, of what you're able to provide from a care standpoint um, and, and you can convince someone of that that it's worth it. You know, with with the um, with a lot of the soccer stuff, I, you know, I've, I've kind of been involved with a few different teams and, and organizations. Now we we got to where we really weren't ordering a lot of MRIs, and if we did, we, we'd order one initially. Um, but ultrasound's so easy to follow out, and, and MRI shows um, edema for so long, it can be really hard to interpret. Um, you know, what means what because you're going to go off your clinical um you know progression anyway um but I, I do find that it makes it a lot easier to follow people out and, and frankly for me it's making sure nothing looks worse um along the way as they're increasing what they're doing um it may not look a lot better if, you know even even though they're progressing back it's slower it lags but but i think that's the sell right is being able to get that information in house follow people out and and um you know do more diagnostic or, or therapeutic stuff in in the athletic training room all right, and so so uh, the next question, Glenn and Michelle both had similar questions, so I'm going to kind of just read through all three of them. Is there certification necessary for this use by athletic trainers? And then Michelle is asking what credentials are required to do the ultrasound guided injections, as well as what credentials are necessary for diagnostic ultrasound only. Yeah, so so good question and, and one that I will answer very politically. Um, you know that probably depends on on where you are and in, in every state, of course, um, whether it's it's athletic training, physical therapy is, is going to have differences in terms of the scope of practice. Um, I think that obviously if you're doing this under physician supervision, you, you want to make sure that they're they're comfortable with it. Um, there are lots of opportunities out there for training. Um, you know, lots of different courses around. That, that can be done, but um, that's a, a question that would be, you know, have a, probably a specific answer person to person for everyone who, who would be listening. Um, you know, the, the hot button topic in Florida is dry needling. And, and so um, something that a lot of patients, a lot of athletes are looking for. And again, you know, from an injection standpoint, um, you, it'd be unlikely that you're probably doing a lot of that outside of a clinic. And, and I think in some clinical environments, you know, athletic trainers, you know, will do injections, but um, I think in the training room, it, it's kind of localizing those areas and, and making sure again, if you're poking a needle into something, you know, you're not poking a needle into something you're not supposed to be, but um, you know, I, I would definitely say the answer to that is going to be individualized based on, on your situation. The next question comes from Danielle. This may end up being our last one. Uh, I come across difficult blood draws for PRPs and have heard that using ultrasounds is very helpful, but I'm usually by myself and have no help. Would this be able to be done with one person? Yeah, I, it, it honestly to me depends on what system you're using. Um, 
you know, and again, you, you can do ultrasound guided where you see it the whole time, but you can also do ultrasound assisted. So um, what, what I find is, you know, if, if you're looking at an anacubital area, the, the vein is not going to be just directly, you know, sagittal or, or, or vertical, right? It's going to kind of angle off. And so what I'll do is I'll make sure that as I've got my probe on the arm and I, and I move it, you know, proximal distal, that I'm keeping it in the middle of the screen. And so if I'm just going directly proximal and the, the vein is moving off, I know that I'm going to go off angle. And so I need to rotate the probe until I've kept basically the, a parallel track with that vein. So you can mark that, right? And, and kind of know that, okay, well, this is the actual midpoint and, and you know, you could use a marker. It, sometimes it's hard with the gel already on there, but take a pen, just the tip of your pen and just make a little mark um, in the skin there for a second. And, and that can help you at least know where you're trying to go. Um, and, and even in some cases, use a, a butterfly needle where you've got your syringe attached to it, but you could you could put the ultrasound on, get the needle in the vein, and then you can take the ultrasound off and, and do the draw. Um, now, now what happens a lot with, with our clinic is that I'll, I'll go in and, and we'll have two of us doing it um, because we do a 60 cc draw with the um, regularly with the, the kit that we use. And so I'll basically get the, the needle in the vein and hang out there for about 30 seconds while that blood gets drawn back um, by an extra set of hands. But yeah, I think that it's certainly something that can make your life easier. Um, mm -hmm. But but depends on on what you need and and how how many sets of hands you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe two other things that might be helpful with the ultrasound is sometimes they we think that the veins are shallow and then we'll once you get the ultrasound on there you're like ah it's actually might take a little bit more advancing of the needle to get there and then valves valves when you yep. see them you know at least like when the athletic trainers in in my office do the blood draw. I'm able to go back in and say, oh, look, there was, you know, there was a valve right there where, you know, because I can see where their needle poke was at and say, you know, that's, that's, you, you just hit a valve. It, it really wasn't a, it wasn't. Definitely agree. And, and that, that happens more, more than you would think. So, you know, it, sometimes if you're struggling to, to get there, but I, I find too, I mean, to, to me, you, I, I'll put the tourniquet on first and then, and then, kind of have I'll scan the veins first and, and kind of pick maybe one or two that, that look like they're appropriate and, and then put the tourniquet on and see but I find sometimes that the the veins that look better from the surface are the harder ones to get to because they may be smaller but sometimes they're just pipes and, and you, you, they just roll you poke them and you think you're there and, and they just skip around so um, it, it definitely can help you pick a vein in addition to to getting into the one that you're trying to get to. Awesome. Well, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, this is a really great presentation. Definitely had a lot of people here. So thank you to everyone for coming um, and look forward to the next one and we'll talk soon. Excellent. Thanks so much. Have a good night.